So welcome everyone. Uh, I don't have much to say, fortunately. I, I'm just here representing the Chalmers AI Research Center chair, uh, who are working together with um, the machine learning seminars at uh, the Division for Data Science and AI today. And we have the pleasure of having Aldo uh, host our talk today. So I'll let him introduce our speaker. Thank you, Frederick. So I have the, the great pleasure of introducing my friend and colleague, uh, Professor um, Jali Meng from the Department of Statistics, Harvard University. Jali, uh, you are known for your breadth and depth in statistics, contributions in statistical inference, CM algorithm, multi-resolution, multi-step, multi-multi. We have the Trinity of Inference. We're running also a course at Harvard about these sort of data science use of data science, but in a principled way, like how do you tap in? What problems do we see? How can you sort of uh, think about that process uh, in, a, in a sort of stepwise uh, uh, coupling or in terms of modeler way? Now, you'll be talking uh, about this specific multi-resolution uh, uh, paper that you wrote with your uh, student, student Lee, uh, but what you also uh, known for, I mean, also received many prizes for the 150 plus contributions, articles that you've written, for the best uh, statistician under the age of 40 uh, by the uh, uh, the commission presidents of statistical society the cops one which is actually that one of the papers written uh, for that for that uh, um, uh, outlet if you want to know more about jali i've actually also recorded uh, a session 101 uh, and the journeys of scholars uh, there you will hear more about the personal journey of, of jali how he started up as a mathematician back in china then found his way to statistics, went to Harvard, and uh, uh, basically how he discovered his topics and how he ended up where he ended up. But the best way to get to know Zhao Li is actually to be here today, which is exactly what you are. So today, uh, please Zhao Li, I uh, have the great pleasure to, uh, uh, to have you talk about this sort of individualized treatment uh, idea. So please uh, uh, give your round of applause. Thank you very much. And uh, I guess I have to stand in some, right? Is that, is that okay? Perfect. As long as my voice carries, I think that should be okay. Um, it's really a great, great pleasure to be here. And uh, I uh, I usually start my talk say, it's a great, great pleasure to be here. And sometimes I mean it. And, and, and this is one of the times I really mean it. That, uh, um, and uh, uh, I know uh, I was calling him Adele, but I now know his order, right? Order, order, yeah. order. Uh, we met each other uh, in a UN. It was, uh, uh, there was a UN session. This is about now three, four years ago on the data common. They're trying to build a global data common and an AI common. Now, I guess, you know, I know you guys are, are interested in AI. These are really hard problems. Think about like globally, how do you even have a common, you know, uh, protocols, how to collect data, how to think about those things. So that was really, really interesting uh, session. And after that, we got know each other. We started to sit, talk about, uh, you know, research of common interests. We started having a course together. And in fact, the course together, we had this wonderful, my student, Jen, uh, uh, Bailey, Bailey, I, I can't even pronounce your name, sorry. <laughs> that, I'm really bad at our names that he's, he's one of a teaching fellow. Um, so, but what I want to talk about today was something that I started more than, well, I think it's about, about 10 years ago. I started thinking about, I was asked to write this more uh, kind of look forward or look backwards, you know, article for this volume, the uh, COPS, uh, you know, 50th anniversary volume. And uh, so I wrote about, what I thought about what would be the kind of big problems for statisticians, at least for you know for the future statistician to think about. So I talk about these particular three kinds of problem: multi-resolution, multi-phase, and the multi-source. Today I'm going to focus on the multi-resolution one. I will say a few words about the other two as well. But since I am a statistician, I like to collect some data to start with. How many of you uh, would be very proudly call yourself a, as a statistician? All right, okay, it's about a few. How many of you will very proudly call yourself a data scientist? Oh, that's interesting. There's statistician, don't consider yourself a data scientist. <laughs> that's all fine. And, uh, uh, but I, I know that we have quite a few uh, mathematicians here as well, right? And uh, uh, so I think this is probably a computer scientist, I assume. Okay, great. Okay, so this is a, probably the right crowd uh, for me to go into a little bit of kind of adapts here. This is a, a talk uh, really motivated by 
a real big problem we all kind of interested in these days now, which is called personalized treatment, personalized uh, medicine, personalized education, everything personalized. But you will see that I will have quite a bit of a notation. And usually when I give talks like this, if the audience is not too mathematic oriented, I have to apologize with all the notation, but I hope I don't have to apologize to this crowd, okay? And I may, I may have to apologize for not having very precise notation. You guys can say, that's a wrong notation. Okay, I, I will definitely uh, welcome that. And, uh, but so let me say that uh, uh, at the time I was thinking about for the future of, uh, you know, young, young statisticians like my student James, like what are kind of problems, at least from my perspective, I think we need a lot more people to work on. One is the uh, very uh, common one these days, more and more people work on those things is the, about the idea of integrating different kinds of data to solve the problem. For example, the, the, you, you know, the problem we are working on is this global poverty has satellite data, has uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, ground level survey data, has all kinds of data. But the emphasis here, the traditional statistical field, we do talk about integrated data as well. But we tend to talk about integrated data with similar kind, the difference is pretty much kind of just different size. But the emphasis now is integrate data with very different kinds. And most importantly, how do you integrate data with very different quality? And, and that was the, uh, the work I've been doing uh, uh, you know, for a while. The other is what I call the multi-phase problem, which is I think the one for any of you working on the real data science problem, you would know it, these days, it's extremely rare for you to analyze data that you collect yourself. The data you analyze typically was collected by somebody, pre-processing by another person, and you know, feature engineered by another team by the time you analyze it, okay? It's, it's really all these different faces. But the idea here is not just the face itself, uh, just because the multi-party involved. The real problem is every face may, uh, based on their knowledge, their goals, they've done things differently. In the end, how do you integrate all of them to create answers are scientifically valid. That turned out to be a lot harder problem than most of us realize. I work in a particular area, it's called a imputation. Like, you know, US Census Bureau's collect a lot of data, the data have all kinds of holes. They don't want to publish data with the holes in it. They do imputation. Imputation is the fancy word to say, I feel in data in some way, right? And then it turned out that it has this following phenomenon that, that even you assuming the data collector has done absolutely the best, Data imputer has done absolutely the best. You still end up, and the data analyst has done absolutely the best. The three things together, everybody did their best. I can show you mathematically, the end answer is not even valid. But that was part of the work I done uh, back in 1994. There's, there's a phenomenon I call uncongeniality. It's because all these different processes, you may or may not be compatible with each other. You can show the situation where you don't even exist, a, a, no matter how broad the mathematical model can contain all three parts in a very coherent way. I don't think it's hard to imagine why that may not happen. When you don't have that conceptual model, you can show the thing, you just can never get it right. Unless you'd be conservative, you know, all the kind of stuff, but you don't have the right coverage, you don't have the consistency, all kinds of issues, okay? So that's another area I work on. But today I'm gonna to talk about really this multi-resolution idea. And the motivation idea, I really start thinking about how do I formulate this thing when I started thinking about the, the, the problem with called personalized medicine, right? That sounds really great. But the question is really, what do we mean by personalized medicine? Let me see if I can, oh, I should use uh, this, right? This one? Yeah. If it works, and it doesn't. Um, yeah, this works, but this doesn't. Oh, that works. Okay, good. All right. So I want to start with this quote from, uh, I assume most people know who Michael Jordan is, not the basketball player, but the uh, if you're a computer scientist, you probably should know uh, Michael Jordan. If you don't, you pretend you know him. Otherwise, people will qualify, will question the qualification of being a computer scientist, but he's such a well-known uh, figure. And now, um, as some of you might know, uh, if you don't, that I... I'm the founding editor for Harvard Data Science Review. It's entirely free. It's for a kind of international forum for uh, the broad data science community. And so you can check online, but not now, but later, okay? Uh, this was the article written uh, last, uh, now last year, right? And Michael Jordan and his team talking about, this video about education. Uh, Berkeley had this wonderful called Data 8 course, which is a way to 
teaching students thinking about data science from what Michael said is called a computational thinking versus uh, you know, inferential thinking, both kind of thinking. But what I want to really point out this particular quote is because of the following, right? That people ask, like, what's the, what is the big deal about data science now compared to, at least the statistician will be saying, you know, we've been analyzing data for 100 years, right? What's so new about data science? And this quote basically says, let me read it because it's, 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 it's important. It's like, where the previous generation were in the position, uh, position of data about general phenomena, we're now in the position of data about specific phenomena, right? For example, in genomics, we have data about each individual gene. In astronomy, we have data about each region of the sky. In medicine, we have data about each tumor. And in social science, we have data about individual humans. What well, era is about data and about specific context in that sense, data science is an appropriate and useful terminology for capturing the current trend. So what Mike and his colleagues are thinking here is really thinking about What's so special is now that we can study very individualized problem, right? But the reason I want to give this quote is look at this, how individual these, these individuals are with enormously different size, right? Individual gene, individual sky, I mean, we're on, only a part of the individual sky, but uh, statistically speaking or uh, uh, broadly speaking, conceptually, it depends on what you consider as the individual, right? Now, this turned out to be the, really the, the question that I asked myself, particularly thinking about the uh, personalized medicine because, um, you know, the typical way, I don't know how this is done here in Sweden, but I think in the United States, we have FDA, the, the Food and, and the Drug you know, uh, you know, Administration, where they will be approving uh, particularly, you know, whether the drug works or not. The way you do it, if you're a pharmaceutical company, you will be uh, running clinical trials. Right. The way to run in clinical trials is to say a randomness, randomly assigning two different kinds of treatment, often one of them is a placebo, to two groups, right? And then and to see after you know a period how many uh, you know gets cured or at least improved, how many survive, so on and so forth, right? So in the end, you you compare that treatment, these two treatments from these two groups, and then say if one group does better than the other, right? You do hypothesis testing, you do treatment effects estimation, so on and so forth. But in the end, you know what, what they really declare is not like the treatment is working for any particular individual. They just said the treatment has a, has a good average performance, right? Now, the, by the time you think about individualized medicine, say, well, you know, that's not good enough. I want to know how the treatment works for me. So that's the point I start thinking about, okay, we all want that, right? We, we, we all want to treat them in the end. If you have any kind of disease you want to treat it, you want to say, how does it work for me? You tell me like that works for people like you. Well, that's some confidence, but that's not enough. Especially if you tell me like, oh, that works for some average population. I'm not an average person, right? Why, why would that give me confidence? But if you start thinking about this, like in a serious way, you would ask yourself, how are we ever going to collect the statistical evidence for proof of something working? This is not a mathematical proof, right? This is a proof to see how the drug is actually working in, in, in your. So, so, so the big picture here is that now we do have this big data, right? Big data, you know, has been around for a while. And these data do allow us to look at people's like, like us. But of course, there's every signal, there's no free lunch in life, right? That none of us is perfect like me. Okay. I hope not, right? Each one think of we're unique. And we are unique, whether biologically. Uh, you know, social wise, right? We're all unique, okay? So the so the, at the end of the day, it's the question is how individual is individual? Now, if you start thinking about that, you immediately realize that is really a philosophical question, right? It's a really individuality. How do you define individuality? So let me give you kind of a, the, the punchline. What I want, what I do today, the whole multi-resolution theory is trying to put in a little bit of kind of a mathematical statistical, more rigorous way of measuring, thinking about what is individuality, okay? And the question to study that is not just for the fun of thinking deeply, for, for the sake of thinking deeply or, or philosophically, because it actually really matters in practice. If I'm going to declare something the individual treatment, what should I tell people? How individual is it as an individual? Where do I stop? right? I guess anyone would agree in practice, it'd be silly to think an individual like, all the way down to your complete unique you, because if that's the case, then nothing we can study about you. Somewhere you have to stop, 
But how do you think about where to stop? How do you make the process not just hand waving? Say, ah, yeah, that, that seems enough. Okay, let's just stop. That's pretty much is the current state of art, to be honest. Okay, but I'll try to put a little bit of more formal language into it. I have to say that this work surprised myself. Initially, when I was doing it, it's more trying to create a set of language for us to communicate. I didn't expect there's actual mathematical results will come out, including a pretty surprising one, at least to me. And I hope that uh, you, you, at least you, you all will be uh, thinking that is probably an interesting question to ask for ourselves. Okay. So, um, you know, with this uh, uh, current the COVID-19, I think that it's, it's very easy for a lot of us to understand the difference between population and the individuals. Like every time we decide something, we're worried about what individual gets. Like, and I'm giving this talk today, what's the chance I'm getting good COVID? Because one of you, you know, have COVID, but who knows? Like you probably don't know either. But all the data I would have would be some public data about the population, right? I can look at about what's the prevalence in Sweden, in these regions. I look at you guys, you look all so very young, probably it's okay. You know, there's all kinds of things I can look at. But these are things that are not exactly my individual risk. It's not even clear what does it mean. Like, what does it mean at this moment is my individual risk? How do I define that? Is that even, does that concept even exist? Right? And these are the kind of questions that, that uh, I want to explore a little bit more than purely just, just argue for it. Okay. So if you start thinking about that, you will realize this is actually, there is a way to think about, but it's almost pushed uh, to the extreme boundary and say, well, this seems like hopeless problem, right? So uh, you just, at least those of you claim you're a statistician, you must, be, you must have heard about there in the recent the last decade or two, there's this whole literature called the large P, small n. P is the number of attributes or number of features, number of predictors, and is the sample size. Right? Traditional statistical framework is n goes to infinity, p stays. Okay? And that generated a lot of uh, lot of papers, a lot of asymptotics. But then people realize, wait, 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 these days, like the n is small, the p is large. Okay? Once I start thinking about this thing, I realize the, the formulation I want is really p goes to infinity and n equal to zero. I'm going to convince you that is a useful formulation. Okay? It's infinite unknowns and I have no data. All right. If you think it carefully, that is the case for individualized treatment. You will never have data direct on you. It makes no sense. I collect data on you. Then you say, hey, it worked on you. Okay. That doesn't, the logic doesn't work here. Okay. But let me be very clear. What do, what do I mean by P equal to infinity? I think for this crowd, I probably have easy time to convince. And, and that crowd people say, you know, where is the P infinity? The, everything in life is finite, right? Including the universe. If you believe the quantum theory, right? everything is good. But the idea here is that if you think about what, what models each, uh, each of us, uh, certainly your whole entire you know, biological, your genes, your combinations, but there are also your environment and your social behaviors. But more than that, if you think, particularly you think about health, you would realize that it's not just about you, your parents' gene, your siblings, all matters, right? When you have something suspicious, the doctor would be asking, do you have a history in your family? Right, you, you get those things. So you can see, if you really start thinking about, the reason I want to use say P is allowed to be infinity, meaning that I don't want to put down any specific P because I don't know where to start. As a conceptual framework, I want I want an, allow this framework to be P, P, go to, P go to infinity. The reason I say the sample size N is, is a zero because you never have direct data. You may have indirect data. Now, if you have a twin brother, twin sister, and they, you're nice to them, so they won't be your guinea pig. They still only have, I would still say they only have sample size half because your twin brother can only take one of the two treatments. You still can't do the both, right? So, so basically I want to really push the boundary just at the beginning was really uh, just as a theoretic framework, but it, but, it, but it turned out to be, there's something useful to, be, to think about this. Can I ask you a mathematical question? Sure. What is N times P? What n times p? Yeah. Great question. <laughs> All right, because I actually avoid that problem. Yeah, you, I, I know exactly what you mean. Because if you're going to do asymptotics, you obviously a lot of large p small n problem is defined what's p to n relationship. You you will get a different kind of things, but but you will see how how I do it at this moment because I don't the p here is the number of the true attributes and the line. It's not the parameter in my model. I'll show you. Okay. Uh, you see, that's why you need a mass matching in the audience. So, okay, so it's a great question. Uh, so moving, uh, so basically the whole idea 
if you think about individuality, it's essentially what I call you're pushing kind of soft match into the hard, hard match. And soft match is just say, okay, take some attributes like people, my age, my gender, my social behaviors, my you know nutrition levels, whatsoever, right? But if you want to kind of keep going at, then then you sooner or later you run into this is a, a, a version of the well-known bias variance trade-off, which you know my student uh, Kelly and I we call it relevance versus robustness trade-off. Relevance here basically means that if you keep if you keep matching more and more, if you can find any answer that's more relevant for you, it just kind of intuitively does the same. The hopefully the person is more the, your 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 proxy person you know comes comes close to you. But the problem is that when you match them more and more, even this indirect sample, approximate sample, the sample size just goes down. So you know the answer you learn from them become less and less stable statistically, right? I, I don't think that you will feel very confident if the doctor say, hey, I have a treatment perfect for you. And you ask the doctor, so where did the evidence come from? He said, I, I treat another person just like you and he was cured. Well, you know, that, that's good news. But I don't think that you will say, hey, no, that's it. Okay, because one person worked, it got work for me, right? It doesn't work. Well, mine doesn't work that way, right? Even maybe that's a perfect match. Okay. Now it turns out that this is a, this kind of thinking is not new at all. That if you do a little bit of a, a, a kind of literature search on, on the philosophy side, which is not really much, that you will you, you will see that this notion uh, was really um, you know from you know from from Galen, probably the one of the two most famous. Uh, you know, philosophers as well, surgeon in ancient time, he was talking about this notion called transition to the similar. Okay. And in, 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 the, in the philosophy literature, there is this, uh, this, this kind of, kind of you know, implicit concept called, called the transitional inference. There are a couple of articles, books on, you know, on, the, you know, on this topic. And particularly, I want to give you a, a quote from Galen, obviously, it was translated by, uh, you know, by Hackinson, which is really quite interesting. And I always uh, got a little bit amused by this particular uh, uh, quote because it shows that Galen was simultaneously a Bayesian as well as a frequentist, except of course, the, none of these concepts ever existed then. But you know, this just shows how people naturally think this way. So whatever he said here is really, I think every one of us can relate that that's how we, how we think about. The first sentence he said, he, he's talking about you know, treating disease. First time he said, in case in which there's no history or in which there's none of sufficient similarity, there's not much hope. He's basically saying, if there's no pride, there's no previously, there's no hope, okay? But look at the keywords here, similarity, okay? This word is gonna play a huge role here, right? It's all about how similar I am to others. So that's a much more a, a kind of a, a you know, pride thinking. But now here the, here the Kim, Kim uh, came the key sentence. And the same thing is true in the case of transference of one remedy from one element to another similar to it. One has a greater or smaller basis for ex expectation of success in proportional to the increase or decreasing similarity of the element, whether or not history is involved. That's a, it's pretty intuitive, right? It's a look at, say, how do I know this, this is going to expect a successful now? I look at the past, right? And I see how similar these situations are. The more similarity, the more confidence it gives to me. Okay? So you can see this is a, there's a way to think about this because the concept of similarity, right? As a mathematician, we think about how to measure similarity. There are many, many ways to measure similarities, right? But this is also a very frequent this statement. Is directly looking at in proportional to, right? Thinking about the frequency. It happens, okay? The last, and the same goes the, for the transference from one part of the body to another part. He's not just talking about disease, one disease to another disease. He said, well, if I treat your hands, you know, maybe there's something related to, you know, to, uh, you know, to your foot. Not exactly the same, but it's the same body, same kind of, right, limbs, you know. So, so basically he's saying expectation of success varies in direct proportion to the similarity. What I'm going to show you now is essentially a one method, one kind of a statistical way to put this into a little bit more quantitative framework. Okay, thinking about the similarity, how to you know how do I model these things? Okay, so uh, I'm starting talking about I think as a whole data science field or AI field, 
we should ask ourselves a lot more kind of philosophical questions. So I call these DS5 questions. So here, the fundamental question is how can we quantify individuality? Number one. Number two, and what insights can it bring? Like, you know, you can think of a lot of uh, uh, deep ways, but what impact can they make? Okay, so these are the these are questions that, that I, I'm, I'm trying to address. All right, let's first thinking about the classic, uh, uh, you know, a clinical trial. And what I'm going to emphasize that I'm going to turn the classical causal inference inference uh, a framework into what I call an approximation theory. Okay. So here, as you realize, as I just emphasized, there's no chance I would ever say that I got exactly right, even with whatever infinite amount of interactive data. Right. This is not the traditional saying like the inference you sample enough time in the, in the end you get the average right because you know we can never know exactly for sure because this you is you I can only approximate you okay but there is a way to try to think about the the amount of approximation right so in the classical uh, clinical trial setting what, what you want to do is you know what you really hope is say if I have let's say this is you right and this is the treatment outcome I give you two different treatment treatment a and b and this is the, what the, the, the standard protocol you know can uh, the the uh, 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 counterfactual thinking, right? You want to say like, if I give it to, if I get A, what's the outcome? If I get B, what's the outcome, right? The real cause effect, at least in this framework, is defined as the difference between the two. The two outcome if you were given two different treatment, but of course it's called counterfactual because I can never really give you two. Although these days there are uh, literatures actually. Harvard Data Science Review just published a special issue called the end of one trial. Did people make a clinical trial on the same person? If you have a chronic disease, you can switch out, switch in different treatment. But if you think really carefully, that's not really the same person because it's the same different time, right? Person time is, is other units, right? So you can always somewhere to break the whole thing, but that's another attempt kind of to be approximately kind of, kind of individualized. But at least conceptually, you, uh, you, you can define this way. But what we really have, the data we have is never on you, right? So what we have is we have data on some, some individuals, we give the treatment A, some individuals give the treatment B, none of, none of them is you. But in the end is what I want us to do is I want to compare, I want to have these groups, somehow the answer will be still kind of approximately relevant for you, right? So, okay. So the most important thing here is we need to construct a population of relevant individuals, or you call the you or you call the process, you know, in a passing population, which is which approximately you. So uh, so how do we do that conceptually? Well, you know, people say, well, what would be relevant? You need to find a, a set of attributes. Let's say uh, you know, what we call the intrinsic attributes, meaning that these are the attributes they have they existed before the treatment. Okay, this is to eliminate the confounding factor. You, you obviously need need uh, to be put. Yes. Uh, also, what's, what's the philosophical thing? What's the difference between this and stress by sample? Isn't that what you have to do? Great, great. Uh, there's, there's no difference. Technically, yeah, that's just a stratify. That's stratified. But you don't actually, the only thing you talk about real difference is you don't actually stratify, right? In, in a, but conceptually, it's, it's about the same. Um, the, uh, but that's a great chart because sometimes people talk about who's post stratification and that brings issues whether it's confounding factors or not. but you're right that's an old oil or experiment design called a blocking that's under the top which which is okay. uh but what i'm going to do here is in some sense is is i'm defining an infinite uh deep in a strata because the key can go to go to go to infinity so if you think about it, like this i'm going to formally introduced the notion called multi-resident resolution because I found the language from the engineer literature from wavelets so that's multi resolution comes very naturally. Um, so in this literature, at least here you can think about you can think about how large the dimension C is is like your resolution level, like where you want to start. Okay. Now so as, as I said, I'm working with engineers actually really this is about like 15, almost 20 years ago now. On, on these images, and really you you have a notion whether you know how how, how many pixels you allow yourself, right? High resolution, low resolution. But what's important in that literature, and I'm just going to show show you this. Um, you have for those of you who are familiar with wavelets, if you're not, that's fine too, because this is this is just a schematic representation. 
Imagine you can decompose your signal into these lower resolution one and these higher resolution ones, right? That's what the detective wavelets does, you know, making the making things are localized. When we talk about primary resolution, you pretty much what you what you're defining, you're actually redefining what do you mean by signal, what do you mean by noise? You're saying any resolution that is lower than the primary resolution, including cell, I would declare these are signals. These are the important features I want to capture. And it's in the higher resolution, I think that's an idiosyncratic variations. I'm going to use that for uncertainty uh, quantifications, but I'm not going to worry about their detail. So one way to think about relevant individuals, you say, well, I want to match all the individuals which have exact the same kind of a lower resolution uh, match, but higher, I'm just let them to be anything. So this allows me to be plausible, to, to recruit others, to be my kind of a guinea pig, but it also allows certain uncertainty uh, quantification, right? I mean, even if you have a perfect person to match you, you did a study, you have no uncertainty quantification. And then we know in real life, the uncertainty quantification is, is, is you know, is, is something very, uh, uh, you know, very important. So this is this is just a just, just schematic way. Now, I have not talked about anything like what I'm going to do here, but I will uh, uh, very soon. The home, so now I need to define, like, in general, how do I set up this? Because this is really for the kind of wilderness analysis, right? So this is just a schematic thing, you know, we're always looking for guinea pigs, but here's a guinea pig that you really want to work on. Okay. So how do I, uh, uh, so now here comes here a little bit of mathematics, which is, you know, in some sense, quite a, quite, quite a trivial. Uh, it took me a while to think about how do I model those things, but then I realized uh, there's a very simple way, right? For any of you study probability or statistics, you know, you have this concept called a, you know, information filtration, right? And essentially is, is a sequence of sigma field or sigma algebra, depending on whether you're probabilist or not, right? And uh, uh, now for those of you who are not familiar with sigma algebra, sigma field is simply a set, a, a collection of sets that are closed and the complement and the uh, uh, countable union, right? Which include a countable, a countable intersection. And uh, so, so that's all, that's a very abstract way, but a more concrete way, particularly for those of us who don't think in terms of sigma algebra, you can think about those things like how many predicts you, you, you include. If you include all predictors here, you have a sigma field generated by them. The way to think about it is these are the, all the variations can be explained by the first R uh, if, you know, predictors, right? In the end, you know, what we do in real life in terms of all these regression models or any models, essentially is to say, there's all kinds of variation in my data which variation is the signal, which variation is the noise, and which variation can be explained by a bunch of uh, uh, you know, features or you know, old, old, you know, old predictors, okay? Is that clear? That's, that's a setup. But the, the, the only thing what I'm doing here is a little bit of kind of unusual. I'm saying I have a sequence of these, these, uh, uh, these, these sigma field go all the way to, to, to infinity. There, there will be one sigma field, which is kind of you know, uh, uh, the most, uh, in the most informative one, most 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 specific one. Do you think of a specific order of these predictors? Great, great question. The ordering is incredibly important here. Okay, yes, but uh, but I will have a results on how do you think about these orderings? Because ordering here, like, let me just kind of pre preamble a little bit. Ordering here gives you knowing how to order them gives you a chance to be sparse. That what's important come first. Yes, absolutely, absolutely good, good question. You assume that they're independent, right? No, I don't assume they're independent. These variables are, are not necessary. Sigma field, you don't need them to be independent. These variables could be dependent, whatever it is. But there's a sequence of variables. You might have a redundancy. If you have, if not in but you might have redundancy, but that's fine. In the in the general framework, you don't have. Yes. The index R W is that related to go back to the image before? Is it how how what resolution scale you are? Yeah. So 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 let let me say you know you know let me let me actually give uh, give, give the next thing. So first, let me say the R here is, a, is the index of, of resolution, which one you want to, which level you want to start. But to take your question about a, a, a stratification, this simply say how deep you want to stratify. That's another way of thinking about. Let's say, so, so let me define in this more general term. So what do I mean by signal at a particular resolution is, is, is just a conditional expectation given that sigma field. That's like a fancy way of saying, this is the group average when you stop at the level. Let's say, let's say this is the age, the second one is, is gender. The first one basically say, I'm going to average all the people with my age, right? 
But if you want to include the gender, now I'm average over all people with my age and my gender. So these are just a group that become more and more uh, uh, concentrated, but you also see I have a few, a few people, right? So you can just play that game all the way down. Okay, there's a group average. Anytime these are, these are, these are group averages as a signal at that level, but there's also a conditional variance at the level, which is how individual in the group deviates from its mean, and that's the noise at the level. Okay, that's all, all it is. So and it's surprising that this actually goes pretty far. But I'm, I'm going to show you in, in that. But so this way, I mean, the reason I set up this kind of more fancy language because you know you can cover a lot, a lot more ground because a lot of things are not simple average. When you do, do deep learning, do all those all those things, it's a lot complicated function, but you can always think about as this kind of sigma theory. Is that, is that clear? It, it is that. Okay. So now here's the interesting part. Okay, this actually leads to a, a, a deep philosophical question I want to with this group. We we discuss this issue. There is a simple uh, you can call it a normal decomposition for statistician analysis of variance if you're mathematician. Essentially, it's a it's an application of the Pythagorean theorem. Basically, saying whatever the conditional variance at the level, like you stop the level. And if you have something higher, right, and then your conditional variance at the level is whatever the high level variance in terms of expected, plus whatever the difference of the group mean, you did not model it, you did not capture, right? So that's just the, that's all it says that anytime I stop, and of course, the additions, we also understand anytime I stop the model, I, whatever the left, I say, well, let me call the variance, or in fact, I include the bias, include everything, but I'm hoping our average there's zero, therefore I can ignore it. Right, so 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 that's the whole whole game. So that's a simple one. What, what's less trivial is do this, right? Okay. So this is the magnitude of signal at the resolution as essentially is not modeled by. Let's say you stop and you say I only take average at in terms of age, but if there's a gender difference, you miss that, right? Because you know there's a gender could be a, a very good predictor, but if you didn't do it, you you would miss it. So this will be essentially how much you miss because the resolution level was not fine was not fine enough. What's interesting is this. I want to spend a little bit of, uh, uh, you know, a few a minutes or so on this one. You can do this telescope away all the way to the infinity, right? There's nothing to stop you as long as this thing converges. Now, you, you, this always converges because you start with the left. Whatever you're doing here, this is a finite number. This will have to converge, okay? Whatever you define. Now, here's the interesting part. When I did this, I told myself, aha, I finally understood why the debate about whether the world is fundamentally stochastic or the world is fundamentally deterministic. It all depends on what are you assuming this quantity, okay? If you are a person believe the world is fundamentally deterministic, what you mean, you're saying, anytime we have uncertainty, it's because we have not seen the hard enough. We have not collected all the information. If I collect all possible information, the treatment outcome will be, will, will be no, will be completely determined by that. If you're that kind of person, you should set this intrinsic variance equal to zero. You're saying that as long as, you know, of course you debate what do you mean by these X, but let's put that aside and say, if I can enumerate all these possible ones, there's also a complication. You say, well, there may, be, may not be enumerable because there's been uncountable in many. But again, let's put all things aside, at least in some concept, you say, if I keep asking like a 20 question, you know, keep asking long enough, I will determine the whole thing entirely. But you could also take the view saying, well, no matter how many things you learn, like you learn everything, the God just like to play game with you. At the end of the day, the God will still flip a coin, say, hey, I'm going to have the treatment to go one way or go the other way. Maybe that is a bias coin. The coin itself depends on all these attributes, but in the end, there's still a little bit of randomness, okay? And that will be allowing this to be, uh, uh, you know, now zero, okay? So initially, when I look at this thing, oh, this is interesting because I am not starting to understand why this mathematical formula is how you put out these two different views. But since there's no there's no possibility to have any finite amount of data to determine to determine this, I tell myself like it's interesting, but I'm going to ignore it. Okay, it shouldn't make any difference for what I want to study. And that turned out to be I was so wrong. Okay, I'm going to show you today whether this thing is zero or not has real consequences. Okay, and it's not that hard to believe it, but once you see it, but at the beginning I certainly did not uh, did not expect that. Okay. This also tells you, if you buy this framework, there's really no, no such thing called a variance, right? Only at the infinite level. All the variance you call is because you have not a group, uh, uh, you know, carefully enough, okay? 
And this is also true. Like people say, what do you mean? You know, if I flip a coin, you know, there's there, there's a randomness. Well, if you if you talk to Percy Dicotis, I hope some of you know who he is. He's a magician, a probabilist. He created a machine that can perfectly flip the coin. If you have all the fixed conditions, you know, there's only one to, to land, right? So it's all the kind of a, a, these, the, the, uh, these unknown conditions. So um, so as I already said, if we believe the word is stochastic, this do zero, otherwise you put a zero. There's no general test to distinguish the, the, these one and the two. That's why initially I thought, well, let me, let, you know, let me forget that. But I'm gonna show you, this is where the power of mathematics is. The mathematics will tell me, I have to pay attention to whether this is zero or not. But before I get to, if I get to the specific uh, model, let me kind of capture what I'm doing in this uh, grass scheme say, right? Think about this, uh, think about this why me is the particular outcome of me given a particular treatment. How do I estimate that approximately? Uh, well, how do I actually approximate that? I basically do three things, right? Well, two things. One is I finding a resolution, they say essentially find a crossing population and take their average. Okay, and that will be essentially, but that's not exactly infinity. So that's a resolution error. Or you can, you can see what well, that's the model selection error. Okay, I have not selected the perfect model. Okay, but I want to select the model, I still need to estimate that average. And that's a typical statistical estimation error. Okay, so here is the typical statistical estimation error. There's a model selection error. Okay, but of course, there's, it's still this thing, right? Even, even if I have the perfect model, no everything, no everything. That that's still possible that God played the game with me. So I have to have this intrinsic variable. So whether this can be zero or not, that is, uh, you know, one, one possible, uh, uh, you know, condition we need to, you know, we need to assume. So I was using pretty carefully using hat for estimation, using duty for model selection. So the, the holy grail in terms of statistics or in terms of data science, in some sense, is let's say any point, Whatever the model I set up allowing the P equal to infinity, the P is the underlying attributes. What I'm going to do is R. R is the working model, how many I actually will choose. So the real life question is how large R should be, right? Multiple question, you know, how large R be, the, which one you're going to pick up, right? How do you collect that? There, there are all these kind of issues, but at least here, uh, you know, conceptually, in what we want to do is essentially say, choose the right number of, of uh, uh, you know a, a covariance here to do the prediction, and because because the ultimately this is the same as the bias variance trade off, except that in this framework that's give you that give you the reward, including I'm, I'm hoping in in, in, a, in a minute to to show you that some of you may have heard at least in the last ten years or so there was this whole thing about the called a double descent phenomenon, right? Like, you know, so bias variance trade-off seems wrong. I'm going to provide you a different interpretation, uh, at least an alternative interpretation, what could happen here uh, in, this, in this framework. I will show you, I can create a double descent, multiple descent, infinite descent easily uh, once, you, once you set this in line, okay? Um, I also want to acknowledge that all the mathematics will do next, and in fact, all the mathematics are pretty much all done by my one of the students. You know, this is what happens, right? The hard work is done by a student. The, the professor gets to talk about um, that. Uh, I mean, he's absolutely wonderful. I mean, he's now assistant professor at the uh, UIUC in, in statistics. But I want to say that the mathematics involved here is, is, is tedious. It's it, it's not hard at all. It's pretty much the same as the non provenance you know, seed method. You basically allow the dimension of the estimate grow with the data itself to do that kind of thing, okay? But I want to show you these results, not just to show you these mathematic formula, but rather to show you, there are something basically that, that tells you what situations you can learn, what situations you cannot learn. They're, they're not learnable, okay, so. All right, so now here I'm gonna give, I'm gonna spend, uh, spend a little bit of time on, on this slide. Now I'm gonna talk about a specific linear model. The only difference between this linear model and many of you have seen is this one I allow have infinite many, uh, potentially infinite many, uh, uh, you know, you know, x. Obviously, beta is not an arbitrary, right? If we talk L two, this sum of beta squared needs to converge, but that's all given because in real life, the y is coming from some real data. Any real data has a finite amount of variations. So whatever the model you put down, the other side has to be finite. Otherwise, the model cannot possibly fit. Okay. So these are the these are things all the given, but but it, but in the infinite setting, you do have to be careful. Uh, uh, their, their restriction here, which is quite important. Now, the, the interesting thing here is 
not only I allow this to be to be in infinite sum, I also allow that it could be after infinite sum still has an error. There's nothing to stop you, right? You can easily simulate models as such. Okay. Now, so whether you believe the world is stochastic or deterministic will depend on whether you set tau square equal to zero or not in this framework. I'm going to show you that that this turned out to be whether tau square equal to zero or not have quite different asymptotic behavior. Okay, so that's a that's you, you, you know that's an interesting. Okay, so here is here is the here is the here is the uh, here is the setup. Okay, so now how do I going to estimate the model? What I'm going to do is I'm going to say okay, this is the my theoretical model. Um, I'm going to determine for any give give me any finite amount of data from this model. Okay, uh, let's set aside n. What's the choice of the R? Because I can't possibly pick all of them. Like, uh, for example, shouldn't the optimal choice of R is the order of the order of log n, the square of the n? Like what's the order of the of, of the R in order to uh, to fit the model to do the uh, to minimize the prediction errors in L two log for predicting one? Is that clear? It's a it's a it's pretty standard setup, except that you have this 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 kind of infinity. But then you also say, well, how are you going to fit that these beta if I stop at uh, somewhere at R equal to, say, 10? I'm just going to do the ordinary least square, okay? That's just one choice. Now, I don't even have to do all the ordinary least square. I don't even have to assume they're drawing normal as high as they have second moments. I can do all the same. So, although I set up this way, that whatever the theory I would provide next, uh, this precise one requires the normality, but in general, you, you really don't. There's only only second order moments in, in the maps. So let's look at what will be the what will be the error for estimating beta using using the ordinary least uh, square. Then turn out to be there are there are three parts. It will be related to the intrinsic errors. Okay. It will be related to what we call this uh, uh, this this religious errors, right? The religious errors they simply say if you stop at R. What is the variability of y that still have not been explained? That's explained by the rest of it. So this is the, simply the, the digital error. You can write them and the difference itself as the um, um, telescope expression, the difference between all the conditional variability you have not eliminated. But is it a misprint there? It's k, not r. No, this is, oh yeah, you're right. Gosh, this should be r, yes. Oh, either this should be k. See, I've given someone comes back, you cannot see this type of, okay. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, this this should be either this R this K. This probably K is better. This just defines define that uh, that chart. Okay. Um, so here is the expression I want you to uh, to look at with me for for, for minutes or so because this start shows the interesting part. So here is essentially say what is the what is the variance of mean square error of this uh, of this estimate of beta if I stop at R uh, in uh, R somewhere. So because you're assuming everything normal, you can write down explicitly what the expression is. And you can do this particularly easily when you have a great students, they can just do it, right? They show you here, here's the expression. But here's the fun part. Look at this, this expression. The denominator is, is a very familiar one. N is the sample size. R is how many variable, how many predicts you, 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 you're including. In a minus two, because I also have X zero as a coefficient. I also have a sigma. I, I also have a tau square, so there's another. So this is like a degree freedom. And what this shows that you don't want the R to be close to N, right? This is the biggest thing that you don't want to fit your, uh, you don't want the model to have this many parameters close to the sample size because, because this denominator is going to go to zero, the whole thing is going to blow up, right? But look carefully, look at the, look at the numerator. But the numerator has an AR plus tau square. If tau square is big than zero, then this guy will never go to zero, right? So you don't want any overfitting. Overfitting is bad. But if tau square can be zero, well, AR itself will go to zero as well because that's a decay, right? The more terms I, I fit, now you can see I can end up with zero over zero. And with all the mathematics in the room, you know, zero over zero is a fun game, right? It doesn't have to be blow up. It depends on how fast that decay comes. So this will give you a hint. If the system decays fast enough, there may not be overfitting problem. I want as many terms as possible. 
You see what you you see what I'm getting there? Okay, and I'll show you what that happens. And I think that this is something really quite interesting. This is a, the literature has not looked at the, these cases when tau square actually can be zero. What does tau square equal to zero means? You believe the world is fundamentally deterministic. If you collect enough, you you can pinpoint that answer. Okay, and I and I will say a few words in the end why that might have some interest uh, connections to. Oh, that never moved. I know. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Okay, but 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 you get my picture, Phil. Okay, so this is the this is the this is the parametric model. This is the kind of linear model. I'm going to show you another one. Then then I give you give you the general result. Oh, let me first first do this. Uh, if tau square is bigger than zero, this will will blow up. This is what these 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 are so-called you know double descent kind of thing. If you get it close, afterwards you do re re reach a regression. So you you can use curve got got up, then the curve got got back. This is so-called the double descent, right? No, but the down the formula is formula. Not the formula because I'm only fitting within that n and r less than n. Afterwards, you have to do rigid regression everything. This this is not even from uh, for, from me. This is from somebody else. But I'm going to show you that I don't have to go to the other region to create all these or or in, in all these decay. So, for example, now here's my r. Their gamma is is you know is uh, is same as as my r. Here, let's say the n equals to hundred. Or r is uh, r can vary from anywhere you know up to hundred. What I what I can do is the following, right? I can create this kind of double descent very easily, right? This is the residual error. So I can put the variables are important, but after why I put a bunch of irrelevant variables. Okay, so they don't include the prediction error. But they make the estimation much more noisy because you put a bunch of irrelevant ones. Okay, so now that now the estimation error go, goes up, but now when I start including more uh, relevant ones, they drive back, right? So once you understand same kind of phenomenon, I can create as many as you want, right? So the whole idea is that I include something relevant and not relevant, there and not relevant. You know, these 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 ridges just just it just happens. This is just another way to show you. This is kind of a you know, it's not like the bias variance trade off is is wrong. That I put different ways to create this, uh, you know, you know, create, create, create these, these phenomena. But let me go on because of time. Like yeah, go ahead. The last one at the end, it blows up again. Yes. But, yes. But here you said the wisdom is that it's not supposed to blow up. It's well, no, because because if it's, it's, if it's close to n minus two, two, that it it, it will blow up in in, in finite sample. Yes, there is a but. But uh, but I will also show you the the uh, you know there uh, there uh, there's another simulation here. So but let me go uh, to this uh, to this uh, to this non parametric model. So this will be another instead of linear model. I'm doing an infinite dimension tree, in infinite depth, depth tree. Everything is go left or go go right, whether it's positive or negative. Now we we did a simple one saying half and a half. You don't have to do that. Uh, this is just for for the mathematical means for for you know for the illustration. The only problem when when you do this infinite depths like is a is a essentially it's an infinite dimensional continuity table. When you have finite amount of data, you will have some cells has no data in it when you go there. So what you do is what we do is kind of another uh, simple method. We do what we call the for the highest of resolution imputation. If that resolution is too high, you go back to find the the, the lowest of one still has highest one still has cell in it. You use some mean to impute the other one, right? But all these details does not really matter. What matters is this, because once you have this method, we can do exactly this kind of error calculation. In this case, it's a bit more complicated, but there are three terms because these zero cells creates another bias and a variance. By the way, this expectation is average over all the training samples. Okay, otherwise you only have one. So, so, so the point I want to make is, is this. Let me, let me show you these two tables and then I give you uh, seriously how many more is another. So we have plus 15, uh, and then if I will start. Uh, sure, sure, sure. Okay, I'll finish. I'll finish. Yeah, okay. So let me, because these two tables are important. Okay, this is the case of how square big than zero. This is the classical case. There's, you know, the world is still sarcastic. What I do is I assume there are three different decay rates. This essentially is assumption of sparsity. Like how many terms you you need to include. The first one I assume is a very fast uh, exponential decay. And this is the polynomial and this, uh, this is log decay. This is the three different way thinking about how many terms you need to include. So using decay rate is another one to model sparsity. People tend to use how many variables. And I don't like that. Variables are, may or may not be the same, but you can directly model, model this decay rate. 
Here are the estimation way. This is essentially that if you have a parametric ones, if you have R variables, alpha equal to one, for example, if you only fit the linear term, if you want to fit all the cross terms, I alpha equal to two, right? Because the combinatorial you, you, you will have two. This is the this is the non-parametric one, right? If you have alpha levels, then categorically it's it's a power set. Okay. So this is simply saying how complex your model is, right? This is the this is the how you know how you know sparsity is. What happened here is the R here is the optimal choice of the R, optimal choice of the how many terms you should include a model. And this is the optimal uh, uh, predicted errors, okay? Now, so basically said that if you have exponential decay, in the case of tau bigger than zero, you pretty much cover the kind of a parametric rate, one of n, that's the typical one. But once you have a polynomial decay, forget, well, polynomial decay is still, this is like a non parametric rate, but with a log decay is essentially not learnable. Your error is log log rate. But if you have this kind of a lot more uh, parameters, now you see that even with this exponential decay, you're only getting that kind of non parametric rate. Once you have the polynomial decay, it's essentially you know, not learnable. Now you have a log log n rate, log n rate. Okay. But this is the classical situation tau square bigger than zero. Next one I'm going to show is what happens with tau square equal to zero. Okay, when tau square equal to zero, pretty much this is the classical. This is almost like the parametric model with, with p fixed. The only the price you're paying is is this is this log n. But if you now look at tau square equal to zero, that was a surprising part. When you have exponential decay, you see your learning rate is exponential decay in n. That means you learn incredibly fast. Okay. Second, you're not overfitting. The only restriction on CN here, it has to be less equal to three because you don't want to be exactly equal to zero. But basically, you say you can fit as many parameters as you want. In fact, you want to fit as many parameters as you want. Okay, that's when the exponential decay. But the moment you start decays like polynomial and and and, and log, then you are going back to this kind of not learnable, uh, you know, not learnable situation. This is also interesting. Even with this infinite dimension tree, which is so many parameters, right? You can learn pretty much still as a, as, as a parametric rate, okay? So with this kind of decay, which means that the terms important has this, this, this expanding decay, you can learn really much faster without worrying about the, without worrying about the over, uh, overfitting problem. Uh, I don't have time to talk about this ordering, but if I have time, we can go back. But let, now let me just show you the, show you the, the, the simulation with that. The string column here will represent exponential decay, polynomial decay, log decay, okay? This is the linear model. And the curves here is that uh, this is the one that the, the, the black curve is the true predicted error. The, that uh, dot line is using cross validation to estimate, so that's that practical. That the only unique, that's the unbiased estimation is like a standard estimation way to estimate a bias curve. And this dollar dollar using information criteria, which is really pretty bad. But the whole idea is that these are the kind of standard uh, uh, bias range trade off, right? If you fit, if you fit a too few parameter the prediction error is, is large, and some point you got optimal. If you predict, if you include more, then the error goes up, right? So all three cases, you, uh, so you, so you have this kind of classical phenomena. This is the way this row is with tau square of big than zero. That's with the stochastic version. But once you have the tau square equal to zero, now see what happened here. Right? This is when, with the exponential decay, tau square is equal to zero. You don't overfit. You just keep fitting it. Well, in the end, there's still a little bit because now you're approaching that tau square zero. But this pretty much says that that if you can treat, if you can treat the system as as deterministic, then the bias variance trade off works by putting all your eggs in the bias bucket, right? Because there's no variance left. So it's not a violation of bias variance trade-off, it's just because the system is deterministic. Now, what's the implication here for the whole machine learning, the deep learning stuff? So I got to thinking about this, right? These days, our models, the deep learning model, the machine learning model can have like billions of parameters, right? So the question is that, and we all understand that a model has lots of parameters, they can memorize the data. So you have no training errors. The only problem when you talk about the, the out sample performance is that you're worried about if there's something happened there that the machine had never seen, right? But if you see, if you think about in terms of the kind of problem out there, there are lots of problems for practical purpose. They're almost like a determinist, determinist, deterministic. 
when you treat like cats and dogs, right? How many cases are there of cats and dogs, right? These, these algorithms, if you memorize law, if you practically whatever can happen outside, the thing they have now seen, oh, so different with very low probability, you can treat that as almost like an approximate deterministic system. What this says that if your infinite system is deterministic, if you decay this fast enough, the finite sample you observe can be treated approximately like a deterministic system. Determined, deterministic system. In the determinant system, you want you never want to waste any data because every data is a restriction to the real real problem, right? Bias variance coming in because you have these data points which are not sitting on a surface, sitting on somewhere else. it can mislead you, right? But if you have if the system decays fast enough, the error rate decays fast enough, the infinite system determinant system can be approximated by by the finite uh, system. And if the system, these variables, you capture the other important ones, you can have this kind of now overfitting uh, phenomena because every restriction is help you to solve, you know, you solve that equation, right? So, so that's pretty much uh, the, uh, these are uh, the, these are the numerical results. You know, you know, repeat the, the same thing. So what this reminds me to study is the following: What kind of a condition under which I can treat an infinite system? as approximately a finite infinite determinant system as approximately finite determinant system. The results I'm working with my student now, remember I talked about with exponential decay, we got this phenomena, but it is the, that's a sufficient condition. That's not a necessary condition. What we are working out is a, a if and only if condition. That's going to be very interesting. The if and only condition is a more nuanced than just this, this kind of exponential decay. But that's the that's the next paper. I hope you will invite me back someday. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Zhao Li, for that uh, excellent talk. I mean, that, I wish we had another hour we could spend to talk about this multi resolution. So we have a couple of minutes. I think class will start in about eleven minutes. I think we have, we have a couple of minutes that we can steal, maybe. Are there any questions? Yes. Yeah, I mean, there have been this uh, recent papers by Bartlett and uh, co authors on studying this similar to your regression model uh -huh. in the over parameterized regime. And yeah. They, they don't have the cross curve zero. They have, they have the voice curve as well. So you have the double descent in their, yeah. in their model, even in the tau square multiple zero. Yeah, if, I mean, right, if the tau square big than zero, I think in order to create this um, double descent, you have to go to the overfitting regions. Yeah, yeah. But without overfitting regions, that, that you, you cannot that. But if your tau square e, uh, equals to zero, you can um, you can e easily create even, you know, even before that. Yeah, but yes. Um, you said for cats, this is a deterministic system, and I would agree. But if, you, if we think of the personalized medicine, then I would say that tau is positive because who is me? I'm not a constant in time. And my reaction to treatments will differ in different situations. You're, you're absolutely correct. But, but here is, but if we really, if, we, if it's a truly unique, like if the tau square is bigger than zero, but basically you're, you're saying the individualized one is, is never possible. And, and some, would, some also would agree with you because you cannot truly, truly individualize. But what saved the world is that you have to think about this. The resolution of the action space is very low. Like in the end, the doctor treatment itself is not, a, it's not a doctor has infinite many different choices for each of the conditions, right? The, in the end, it's like the, the doctor, the treatment will be categorized into sort of maybe four or five different treatments. So the question then is that, is your study matters in a way that the information come up will change the doctor's, uh, you know, uh, you know, doctor's, uh, you know, treatment. If not, the action space defines the, the equivalent class for all these things. So you can pretty much think about for the for 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 infer the membership in that class, you can treat that, that tau square is like right, practically zero. Yeah. So that's the way. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Otherwise, otherwise there's nothing to be learned, right? Because if everybody is so unique, all the variations and uh, and I don't think we that's what I think of one one real thing I wanted to I'm writing another paper. I say that if the FDA or any any uh, these uh, medic um, uh, these uh, health organization if they want to ever uh, label some drug called individualized, I want them to label to what degree, 
right? You need to have a label, just like a pixels, right? Like a, what pixel you're, you're given, you need a level. You can't just talk about individual life because that's really misleading, right? Maybe two level, level two, level three. And this is giving them a concept of how to do that, yeah. If I can just take up for, on this point from the medicine and sure. very quick. I think one issue is that you need doctors to understand statistics to actually know okay, where where does they fit in the solution. I think it's which is going to be a challenge. Uh, absolutely. There's no chance this way to start. But 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 the real thing is you need to create a software, create things like you know, having those things nuanced. That's why we need specialists like us. So the one big thing, I'm glad you asked that question is, we all need to communicate much better what we do to let them to trust us, not necessarily they understand us, but trust us so whatever we say, they will listen. That's more important than to explain everything. They say, I understand they didn't do it. They, you know, a lot of things that we do, we don't, I don't know how the computer works, but I trust them, right? I, I use it. So I think that's the key thing, but thank you for that question.